Welcome to a screencast of tutorial 5. I'm going to start off looking at the carbon monoxide data. Now this is a partial carbon monoxide spectrum. Column F here has got spectral data for four of the spectral lines in the carbon monoxide spectrum. This first spectral line is at around about 19.22 wave numbers. These additional spectral lines are adjacent to one another. And we can see that the difference between any two spectral lines is around about 3.8 wave numbers. This is, tells us, of course, that this first spectral line is not the 0 to 1 transition. Now, the first job that you have as a spectroscopist is to assign the initial and final quantum states to each of the spectral features. So I need to know what is the initial J state and the final J state for each of these four spectral lines. Well we can use this equation down here which relates the frequency of a spectral line to the rotational constant and the J quantum number. The way that I can do this most easily is to rearrange this equation such that j plus 1 is equal to nu over 2b. If I calculate the frequency divided by 2b, then that will tell me what j plus 1 is approximately. Because remember, this data does have some centrifugal distortion. This is data from a real molecule, a real experiment, and so there is going to be some centrifugal distortion. So this equation here, which would have been exactly equal for a rigid rotor, is only approximately equal for a non-rigid rotor. So how can I use this information to approximate what the uh, J state is? Well, I know that the distance between adjacent lines in frequency space is equal to twice the rotational constant. So 23.06 minus 19.22 is equal to 2b. So let's use that. So if I go to this cell here, E2, I know that j plus 1 must be an integer. So I can force it to be an integer by rounding the value that I calculate either up or down to the nearest integer using the inbuilt round function. And I can make sure that it is an integer by specing the number of decimal places that I have to zero. So let's divide the frequency by 2b, which will be the gap between adjacent spectral lines. Okay, so that's my value for j plus 1, and I'm going to round it up to the nearest integer, like so. I can then, if I drag that down, I can calculate j plus 1 for all four transitions. I've got a problem there, what have I done? Whoops, so I forgot. Um, this needs to be protected, and so did that. like so. And now there's autocomplete. There we go. That's better. Right. Now j, of course, is just going to be equal to this value minus 1. So let's do that. Equal to this value minus 1. e2 minus 1. I'll just type it in. And now I can autocomplete that data. OK. Now to complete the regression, I need to calculate the independent variables. Now the equation I'm fitting to this spectral data here is going to be this one here, which is the equation for the frequency of a spectral line, both in terms of the rotational constant and in terms of the centrifugal distortion constant. The two independent variables in this function are 2j plus 1, 
2 into j plus 1 and minus 4 into j plus 1 cubed. The parameters will thus be b and d and of course the dependent vari variable is just my uh, the wave uh, numbers of my frequencies given here. So let's go to this cell here. It's going to be equal to 2 times E2. And this is going to be equal to minus 4 times E2 cubed. Like so. If I highlight both of those and fill in the rest of the data like so. OK. Now I'm ready to do the regression. Now it's potentially possible that you haven't yet installed the uh, the data analysis add-in so let's show you how you do that I'm using Excel 2013 but it's all relatively similar so we go to the file key and we go down to options then you'll get a pop-out window which has a tab which is add-ins if I click on add-ins then at the bottom of this you see manage Excel add-ins and then you click go and I want to include the analysis tool pack and the solver add-in I've already flagged these because they're already installed and then you would just press OK to install it but since they're already installed no problem there it may take a minute or two for the installation to occur but it will install it without you having to restart Excel if you then go to the data tab at the top here and click you will have now under analysis two new things one is data analysis and the other is solver we're going to be using data analysis first of all so let's click data analysis that opens up this pop-up window it tells me all of the different things I can I may want to do I'm just interested in regression for the moment so scroll down until you find regression highlight regression and click OK. Right, so we've got a Y range and an F range. They've already been pre input. Let me just show you how you do that. So I get rid of that data and then let's highlight that again. OK, let's uh, I'll take off everything for the time being. So clear. This is what it would look like if it was the first time you'd started it up. So if I go into input Y range, my Y range is my dependent variables which are the frequencies of my spectral lines. Now I'm going to want to include the labels which are given in this first row. This enables me to more easily identify the parameters when Excel goes ahead and does the regression. So let's flag labels and I'm also going to flag constant is zero. I don't want the program to determine what the intercept would be because in this equation, this model equation here that we're fitting, there is no intercept. This equation implies that if b is equal to zero and d is equal to zero, the frequency is equal to zero. So the intercept goes through zero. So now let's input the y range. So click into this box and then highlight f1 to f5. And now we need to input the X range. And the X range is all of the independent variables, including their labels at the top there. So H1 to I5. And then all you need to do is click OK. A new worksheet should appear to the left of the, uh, of the partial carbon monoxide spectrum worksheet. And at the moment because there isn't any wrapping going on I can't see all the information in the A column but if I move my cursor between the A and B column you can see it changes to this double headed arrow icon and if you double click it then the width of this column adjusts so that you can see all of the information I can do exactly the same for the B column and indeed the C column I can now see all of the information I want this final table at the bottom here has the information that I need. First of all, it tells me the parameter associated, the value of the parameter that is, associated with the 2 into j plus 1 independent variable, which is of course the b parameter. 
and here we have the parameter associated with the minus 4 into j plus 1 cubed independent variable which of course is the d parameter. The wonderful thing about this add-in is that it also calculates the uncertainty in each of these parameters. So this 2.5 times 10 to the minus 7 is the uncertainty in the b parameter and this 2.5 times 10 to the minus 9 is the uncertainty in the d parameter. So we know the b parameter to around about 7 or 8 significant figures and we know the d parameters to uh, about 3 or 4, about 4 significant figures. Let me just copy these two values so we can start using this to get additional information about the structure of carbon monoxide. So I'm just going to copy these two, control C, go back to the original worksheet, partial CO. If I go to the go to B5 here and press control V to paste those two values in. Paste them in as values just in case. There we go. Okay, I've now got a B value and I've got a D value. But when I'd solved the Schrodinger equation, I know that the B parameter has this relationship to the moment of inertia here. And the moment of inertia we know for a diatomic is equal to the reduced mass times the bond length squared. So I can use the information about the rotational constant to calculate the moment of inertia and then subsequently to calculate the bond length. So let's do that. The moment of inertia is going to be equal to is going to be equal to h Planck's constant which is b2 divided by 8 times pi squared okay there's an inbuilt function for pi in excel it's just pi open bracket close bracket times B times C and I need to convert C to centimeters per second so I need to multiply by 100. There we go. There's the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is equal to the reduced mass times bond length squared so bond length is equal to the square root of the moment of inertia over the reduced mass. So let's do that. It's going to be equal to the square root, open bracket, moment of inertia, divided by, whoops, is going to be equal to B7, divided by, open bracket, the reduced mass for this molecule, which is uh, 6.85 atomic units, so B1, and then I need to convert that to kilograms, so I can do that by multiplying by B4. And I get a value of 1.13 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, or 1.13 angstroms. We also know that because the centrifugal distortion constant depends on the force constant of the molecule, there is a relationship involving the rotational constant and the centrifugal distortion constant that enables us to determine the equilibrium vibrational frequency of the molecule. And it's this equation here. So I can go up here and use that equation to calculate the vibrational frequency. It will be equal to the square root of B, whoops, sorry, 4 times B cubed divided by D close bracket and there we go we find that the vibrational frequency is about 2155 wave numbers pretty close to the value that uh, we reported in the lecture notes themselves so that's how you do regression you need to identify the equation that you're trying to f use to fit to your data now that will come from some kind of theoretical model this theoretical model as you can see has two parameters that we are going to derive during the regression process and these are for this particular equation B and D. You then need to identify the 
independent variables, which for this case is whatever is being multiplied against a b, which is 2 into j plus 1, and for the d parameter it's minus 4 into j plus 1 cubed. The independent variables are the spectral frequencies. Then, and perhaps the trickier thing, is identifying what the quantum states are that link together during the transition, i.e. the initial quantum state and the final quantum state. This particular equation is only in terms of the j quantum number, so I need to know the initial j quantum number and the final j quantum number. Okay, I think that's about it. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you soon.